Hey, it's Freddy Cruz, and I've made it my job to share with you the stories of the individuals, the businesses, and organizations that make the greater Houston area great. One such organization is Houston Pet Set, founded by twin sisters Tina Lundquist Faust and Tama Lundquist, who have dedicated much of their lives to solving the homeless animal crisis here in the Houston area. In August, they released For the Animals, a documentary that sheds light on that very issue. During this episode, we talk about the documentary, as well as the biggest challenges that Houston faces, and we can't have a discussion about the biggest challenges without at the very least acknowledging some policy wins over the past couple of years. If you enjoy this episode, please consider sharing with your family and friends and signing up for the newsletter at cruisethroughhtx.com. Hi, I'm Ed Sheeran. This is Bruno Mars. Hey, it's Katy Perry. This is your man Flo Rida with Freddie Cruz. This is AJ Mitchell with Freddie Cruz. Freddie Cruz. Freddie Cruz. Freddie Cruz. Let she go pick Mr. 305 and you already know what it is. My name is Freddie and it's time to cruise through HTX. I followed your work, had no idea that you all lived in Minnesota for quite a, quite some time. My wife and I spent a few years up there and there's quite a difference between the way things are up north and here in the Lone Star State. But I want to I want to ask you this, what do we share in common rather than point out all the differences? I I think we share. I'll jump in. I think that we share um There are so many good people in Texas that care about animals. We know that states like Minnesota, states in the north, um, they treat their animals really well. And although we have this severe problem down here in people, some people become apathetic to kind of the stray animal crisis. There's also this passion for animals that we see that's similar to what we we experienced in Minnesota. And those are the rescue groups. Those are the rescuers, the individual um, adopters and fosters and street feeders that love and care for the stray animal populations. So um, we say in animal welfare, sometimes we see the worst in people, but on the flip side, we see the best in people. There are good people in both states, and you know that was that's what makes a culture in a state are the people and and how they live. And so, coming from Minnesota and going to various other states, another country, and then coming to Texas, it felt really good. There are a lot of similarities in the people, and just so happy to be here in Texas and think it's a fabulous state. Absolutely, and it almost seems like. Maybe because it's so cold up there, I mean, just unbearably cold up there, that maybe that sort of lends Mother Nature sort of lending lending the people up there a, a helping hand, if you will. And you would think that it would be the same way because it's as cold as it is up there, it's brutally hot down here. You're right, Freddie. There, there is a year-round breeding season here and animals in Minnesota, the northern states, you know, where it freezes and gets super cold, those strays don't survive, unfortunately. But in the southern states, they survive, they live, they breed. And that's how we've wound up with this kind of catastrophic situation of overpopulation of animals. So you're 100% right. That's an acute um, observation on your part that the weather does play a part. Can each of you, if you would, walk us back to the moment that you realized the homeless animal issue was worse than you had imagined at first? I remember the exact moment we were filming another documentary in an area of town called Sunnyside. And it was a day that was very tough on us. It was heartbreaking and backbreaking. And the things that you see when you're on the streets in those lower socioeconomic areas are just, it's heartbreaking. And the animals and the people are suffering. But what we saw with the animals was was heartbreaking and crushing. And I remember thinking, we'll never We'll never get out of this problem until we figure out what the problem is. And I remember saying that to the documentary filmmaker who was also looking for solutions. And we just said, we've got to figure this out because 
we didn't realize it was so bad. We keep putting money toward it. We keep raising funds. We keep supporting the rescue groups. You think you put all this work into it and then you get out there and you see the problems getting worse and not better. So we're doing something wrong. But what were we doing wrong? And that's when we started to gather data and say, we need to find out what the issue is before we can actually solve it. I actually got my Sonny Corleone, my favorite street dog, shouldn't say favorite, one of my favorite street dogs ever um, that next day, but it was a result of that trip out in that area. Did you give him the name Sonny Corleone or was that the name on his tag? That came from me. It actually came <laughs> from a friend of mine. We were trying to think we were trying to think of a bad ASS name, a bad um, a bad name for him. So he he would get over his suffering. So he would get oh. over being a victim because he really was victimized and his soul was just crushed. You could see it. He's a very sensitive pit bull. He's the sweetest dog I've ever had by far. And I said, No more, no more victimization. You're gonna be a badass. Your name is Sonny Corleone and you're gonna act like it. And um, but he's also our sunny bunny and our sunny and our sun bun. And so on the other side, sunny can be a very sweet name too. Do you want to jump in, Tina? Um, yeah, he is. He is one of the sweetest dogs ever. And, and uh, we do call him sun bun a lot, you know, and he is the sunshine in our lives. So um, yeah, he's a good one. What do you, and again, I'd like to get an answer from each of you. What do you do? Because it, w- watching the documentary for the animals, it, 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 it was equally heartbreaking and then also you provide hope and there is a lot of humor to sort of balance everything. But I mean, the heartbreaking parts are are still heartbreaking and you know the issue is still there. Like as we speak, there are animals, whether it's Sunnyside, uh, my family lives in and we call it the brown part of Fifth Ward um, and the animals are, are just, they're all over the place. My dad helps quite a few of them. Um, as much as he can. And so what do you do to keep fighting this fight when it seems like you don't have any gas left in the tank? I I think there's two things that fuel that. I think, number one, we have hope. We believe that this problem is solvable, and that's what we hold on to. We're problem solvers by nature, and we see the hard work by our rescue partners, by the people doing street feeding, and we want to share that hope with them so that they continue to believe that this is solvable. Also, when you see the problem, you 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 can't look away. As much as we love animals, as much as other people in this, what we call industry, business, love animals, once you see it, you you can't ignore it. You have to do something to help. And so I think that that fuels us more than anything is even if it's one dog, and I don't mean even, that's a heartbeat, that's a soul. Even if it means we provide veterinary care and boarding until it can go on a transport, that keeps us going because it's one more. I got a photo this morning of a dog named Bump whose life has been just tumultuous And um, he finally found his home on 30 acres in northern Minnesota with his mom named Ashley. He was, you know, a dog that got dumped here in Houston, and he's a purebred bloodhound. Those are the things that keep us going. So we we cherish those those big wins and small wins. I, I would agree with Tina. It's it's the heart, the compassion, the empathy. Um, the need to problem solve, the desire to problem solve that really fuels this. And what we've seen over the last 20 years is enough motivation to keep us going the rest of our lives. We don't need to see any more, but we do see, we do see terrible situations every day. So we're continually slammed with this motivation. And I think that if we couldn't help them, it would hurt our hearts even more, the ability to act upon seeing that suffering and suffering because we're seeing the suffering. Um, the ability to act sort of metabolizes that suffering for us. And, and so being able to help really helps us as well. And then we just want to see Houston and Texas do this well. We do so many things well here in Texas. We love this state. So glad to have found out about it and and found our way here. Thank you, Tyson Faust. Um, And so happy to be here, but we can't have the fourth largest city that's doing so many 
things well, not do this well too. And so it's sort of a, a goal and a pride issue in living in Houston that we need to get this done. Yeah. And I want to piggyback on something that you had said, because it's like you, you can't, when you, once you see it, once you see an animal and it doesn't even necessarily have to be a dog, it could be a cat. Um, but you see an animal suffering because maybe it got hit or maybe it's just loose and stray. It's emaciated. It, it's got mange or, or what have you, you see that animal, but you know, for a fact that you're going to be five minutes late to work and you cannot be five minutes late to work. So you drive by it and then you come home and then you're reflecting on what you did not do. And so now you want to help. You want to maybe join pet set or you maybe want to join citizens for animal protection. You maybe want to join and maybe volunteer at bark or where all the numerous organizations, or you want to be one of the, what, what you would call a street feeder, uh, which is they're, they're, couple of them uh, featured in the documentary for the animals. I wouldn't necessarily call my dad a street feeder. They kind of just migrate to his to his house. Uh, he's almost like a like an Ace Ventura type. He even lets a couple of them in. Uh, shout out to Red and Chata. Those are the dogs. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, my dad. He's a he's a hero. He's a beautiful soul. And um, but but what. What advice, I guess, tactically speaking, because you all are on the ground, what advice would you give to somebody who sees one of these animals and they are at the end of the day animals and there's that instinct and they're scared, they're anxious, and there's that propensity, that likelihood that they'll, you know do something. I think I, uh, that's a, that's a great question because, um, People in Houston probably see it often, unfortunately, and what do you do? The number one thing that we always um, encourage is safety. Don't get in traffic. Don't, you know, get hit by a car. Be careful of animals. Be careful of the surroundings um, that you're in. But if you can get that dog in your car and bring it home and temporarily um, hold it, that's one of the best things you can do. But that's not available to a lot of people. Um, you might have dogs at home, you might have cats, you might have children, it might not be a safe situation, which is why we strongly advocate for open intake in our shelters. Right now, Freddie, we're at a, a situation or a, a program called managed intake where you need an appointment to bring a dog to the shelter. So Freddie, if you were on your way home, you picked up a dog at three o'clock in the afternoon and it was a Thursday, you would have to make an appointment to get that dog into bark. We believe that the shelter should intake animals. And unfortunately, it might increase euthanasia rates, and that's super controversial. But is it better to leave that dog potentially um, at risk on the streets, or is it better to give it a chance in the shelters where a rescue group could potentially pick it up and 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 give it a home? It's there are a lot of things that play into it, but our, our guests, to answer your question, the best thing someone can do is probably take it, bring it home and, and try to foster it and reach out to someone like Houston Pet Set to help. Did you want to build on that, yeah, Tama? I, I, yeah, I totally agree. And it brings up the bigger issue of leadership in this city and this county and why we have managed intake and how they're worried more about what their live release rate is than they are about the animals on the street. And it's something we need as citizens to think about and talk about. Um, as Tina said, the animals, the hundreds of thousands, maybe close to a million of strays on our streets are suffering. They don't have the resources like a squirrel or another animal has because we've taken that away by domesticating them. So it's our responsibility, moral and ethical, to care for them and make sure they have the resources they need without the shelters being open because I've lived in other cities. You, you have, Tina has, you, you call a dog catcher, you call a shelter, you call somebody when you see a stray, you don't have that in Houston. And it's almost no. unheard of for a large metropolitan city, not to have enough ACOs slash dog catchers to come out and pick up a stray, which is why the private and nonprofit sector is doing the lion's share of the work. So yes, please, Try to take that animal home if you can. Please care for it. Please reach out to Houston Pet Set. We can help with costs. 
but also please talk to your leadership about the importance of taking care of the animals over the reputation and over pandering to this live release rate, which um, it, it really only hurts the animals in the long run. My dad, you know, I'm talking about him quite a bit here. Um, my my dad, he was getting gas. There was a Burger King by the gas station uh, over off of 59 in Collingsworth area. He sees the truck right? And basically what you would think would be a dog catcher. Um, and he's like, Hey, there's, there are a lot of animals and I can't, you know, I can't be taking care of them. It's not safe. Can you do something about it? He l- unravels this list. These are all the reports I've got to answer to. And so essentially no, and there's a backlog. And that is so heartbreaking. Uh, because to your point, and you make this point in the documentary that we we made a pact with these animals, whether whether or not it was you two specifically or me, this our ans our human ancestors made this pact, and it's a long lasting, lifelong pact that pact that we made with these creatures to take care of them. And so, y'all. It's election season. We're glad to have a change. We also are making this uh, a platform issue. We, as Houston Pet Set co-presidents, created a, not created, but organized a forum for the mayoral elections to talk about this this issue. And so we want to see what the candidates say. It's not the only issue that Houston has, but this is now a city um, quality of life public safety issue. It's gotten so out of hand. So even if you don't care about animals, which is unthinkable. Um, But if you don't, you have to care about your city. You have to care about its citizens. You have to care about your constituents if you're in politics. And so we want, we want leadership that looks at this and says, this is so solvable. Other cities do it. Let's just get this done. What would be a favorite win over the course of the past year or two years that really does give you hope? I think the legislation and the ordinances that have been passed are key to changing the culture in Texas. Um, There were um, bills passed in 2021. It was a Safe Outdoor Dog Act that finally defines what um, shelter looks like for animals. Um, We protected the Breeder Act, which means um, that it had to do with breeding. And then there was a new legislation that was passed this year that said, if you have five or more breeding females, you have to be registered with the state so that they can inspect and they can um, watch you. Because right now it's a free-for-all. It's the wild, wild west for breeders in Texas. And they come here because there's no oversight. So that's why we have so many backyard breeders, puppy mills, selling alongside the the road, selling in parking lots, which is illegal. We don't have enough law enforcement to enforce the existing ordinances Um, Those are wins. Those are big wins. And it's going to take a while for those wins to trickle down. But that's really important. We also passed an ordinance in Houston that said all animals need to be microchipped. 95% of animals that have a microchip can be returned to owners. That's huge. And we also passed an ordinance that said all pet stores must source their animals, dogs and cats, from a humane source, which means they need to come from a shelter. They cannot source them from backyard breeders and puppy mills any longer. And so these are all the things that it's going to take to continue to um, change the landscape for animals in a big way. They're huge wins for Houston and Texas. Yes. And as Tina said, we haven't seen the results of that on the streets, but we need changes like that from our city, our state, and our county to be able to solve this problem. Right now, the lion's share of the work is being done by the private and nonprofit sector. We cannot solve this without the city, state, and county jumping in to do their part. And so by getting these ordinances passed, it means that they're starting to look at things like this. We're getting it done. We're getting it done. And I would say I would say locally, some of the wins are, you know, getting Walter off the street. If you watch the movie, saving Walter's little life, giving him, giving him the love and, and letting him know that he counts. And there are tens of thousands of dogs like Walter every 
year that get saved by the rescue groups and they know love and they might have started, they might have been born on the streets, suffered on the streets, but they will find a home and they will feel love and they will leave this world knowing that they mattered. And they will also bring so much joy to a family and to a household. I mean, what we give to them is nothing compared to what they give to us in value of, if you value love, loyalty, companionship, um, just feeling better and making you smile. So those are all big wins, Freddie. Every single one of those heartbeats that we saved, whether it was a kitty, a horse, a rabbit, or a doggy, they're all wins. In 200 years, somebody discovers your story. What do you want them to take away from it? In 200 years, that, that there were people that cared, that there were people that were passionate about a cause, that there were people that were passionate about um, compassion, love, caring for sentient beings, and being a more civilized community. I think we have to become more civilized and animals make us more civilized. Our pets make us more civilized. They teach us things that um, we as humans, because we have egos, need to be taught. And I hope they look back and say they were better because they cared for the animals. They were better. Their, Their society became better because of the animals. I've heard the term used for the rescue community and people leading the charge as as pioneers. And I hope that when they watch, if they watch a movie in, in 200 years, they say, wow, this was a problem. We can't believe it. And, and look what a group of caring individuals can do um, and maybe give them hope for something that might be wrong in society at that point. But I hope that it's so not an issue then that they are sort of shocked that this was an issue at one time because we need to get our arms around this and solve this once and for all and not have it be a problem in 200 years. Let them be shocked at the way things were. Just the way we look back 200 years prior to where we are or from not back um, from where we are and we look at things and we say, wow, I'm so glad that's not a problem in our society today. Could not have said it better. I love both of those answers. Y'all, please, 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 if you say you love the animals and you care for our animals and you care for the dogs and the cats in this city, you owe it to them and yourself to watch this documentary. It's for the animals, available on Apple+. Plus. Amazon. Uh, Watch the trailer at the very least. Also, Houston Pet Set is the organization. They're at HoustonPetSet.org. Tina and Tama, y'all are pioneers. Y'all are inspiring, and you really do give give us all hope for, for the future. Thank you both for joining the show today. Thank you so much for having us, Freddie, and making this a part of your show. It's so important that people with a platform share this. Thank you very much. Hey, it's me. I'm back with a quick little nudge. If you enjoyed this podcast as much as I did putting it together for you, then please leave a review on your favorite podcast platform and subscribe to the newsletter at cruisethroughhtx.com and share with your family and friends. Thank you.